Hi, everyone. Before the episode begins, I just want to remind you to follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Marlene the Plant Lady and YouTube, Everything Gardening with Marlene Simon. And remember, please, please, please rate and review on iTunes and Spotify. That just helps the podcast get a notice by more people and then more people will become better gardeners. And that's what we all want. So enjoy the episode. Look at that plant. I want you to know that everything was grown in my garden. Don't touch that plant! Is it poisonous? She'll become part of the plant. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Flower Power Garden Hour. I'm your host, Marlene, and we are talking about bees. We all know the importance of bees. We all know, sadly, that uh, we have a lack of bees. And if we have no bees, we have no food. Um, So joining me is, you guys will probably know her as uh, a sidekick on Good Day. You're my sidekick, Tina. See, like that? Tina Makua and Blake Dacey. Uh, He's also known as a Sacramento beekeeper on Instagram. And uh, they're joining me to talk about bees. Thanks, guys. Morning. Hello, hello. Hi, hi, hi. Hi. So you guys are two successful beekeepers. I am a failed beekeeper. Um, but Blake, before we started recording, what I liked is that you said that you too lost some hives when you first started out. So one, that makes me feel better. And I think two, that makes anyone who has tried and failed to realize that it's, you know, it's sort of like gardening, you know, you're going to lose some things. I guess we just feel bad because bees are so important and they are, uh, little creatures versus plants that, I mean, my plants have feelings, but you know, not so much like bees. (laughs) Um, so Blake, how long have you been keeping bees? Well, about a decade now. Okay. And what made you decide, Hey, this is something I want to do. I've always been gardening and farming my whole life. And one year we ended up with a bee box that was just totally old and destroyed and decayed. I think we paid $10 for it and no frames in it, just an empty box and bees ended up moving in and I harvested the honey that year. And I was so intrigued and, and hooked. And that was the, that's what set the hook on my, uh, beekeeping adventure. Did you have any clue what you were doing when the bees moved in? Did you go and like check them or did you just go one day and say, Hey, I have honey. I'm going to go collect the honey. Checked them once. Didn't know what I was checking for or why I was checking it. And then the second time we went out was to pull it apart and get the honey out, which we also ended up causing that hive's demise by not pulling things apart correctly because we didn't know what the proper process was. Got it. Okay. But then you were hooked. So that's yep. one one failure right there because you went and got the the honey and you weren't quite sure. And then did you go, hey, how soon after did you pull the honey? Did that did they disappear or die? We pulled the honey at the end of the summer and then by the middle of fall they were gone. Okay. And you're pretty sure that was the reason? Yeah, I suspect there was pressure from uh, raccoons and other things like that at night. Got it. I think we were the main main cause of that demise cuz they'll do just fine without us. Yeah, I that's how I sort of, so I, on my property, there's two old walnut trees and there's actually two hives and I've been here seven years and they were here when we moved in. And I'm sure if we were to cut that tree open, the amount of honeycomb and honey would be amazing, but they just keep doing their thing every year. They're there, they're there. And I'm, I'm not messing with them. It looks like Winnie the Pooh, like your stereotypical hole in a tree where bees go in. So um, they're not in the best place. One of them's right by the mailbox. And I'm always fingers crossed that our mailman is not allergic to bees. And, you know, <laughs> even though they're fine and they're docile, it's just, you know, if he happens to hit the tree with his <laughs> mail truck one day, I don't want to be there to see what happens. Uh, Tina, when did you get into bees? Well, this is my seventh summer. So it all started when I did a story on Good Day Sacramento with uh, what was called the, you know, the Sacramento Beekeepers uh, store downtown on X Street. Mm-hmm. It's now the Sacramento Honey Company. And uh, I interviewed Nancy, it was owned by Fred and Nancy Stewart. So Nancy, I had no idea about bees and I was intrigued. But when I was doing the segment, it was in November when nothing really is going on, which I didn't know. I just wanted to do a story over there. And I, after that, I was so intrigued Come spring, I ordered my first package of bees and got the equipment 
And I too failed after <laughs> that first season. I only had one and I was very, very sad when they died. What do you think happened to yours? Do you know? Uh, you know, lack of um, experience, um, probably, you know, they got a lot of moisture during the winter time. It was in the wrong spots. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I have no idea. It could be a lot of things. And, and as time went on, then you kind of learn, oh, it could be, you know, mites. It could be this, it could be that. It could be, you know, insecticides. Who knows what it is, but it's still very sad when you lose one. Yeah. I remember my first hive, it was doing great. Thanksgiving day. I was going to go show off my bees to everyone. And they were, you know, pretty far from the house. I'm like, let's go look at my bees. And as soon as I got there, I, I realized there was a lack of movement and everyone's like, oh, bees. And I'm like, uh oh. And sure enough, I opened up the box and they were gone. They weren't dead. They were gone. And what I think happened to oh. mine was the pressure. I had ants. And since there wasn't a, there, you know, they weren't, there were, there wasn't dead ones around. Someone said, oh, they probably just got pissed off about the ants and mm -hmm. absconded. I like that absconded. So it's sort of similar, Blake, to what you said. There was pressure from raccoons. And I mean, I, I'm sure I did other things wrong, but I knew that the ants were one big problem. That speaks to what you said about, uh, about people gardening and there's different things to learn because you can look at the tree out in the forest and watch it grow. But if you want to grow a plant yourself, you're now in control of all these variables and you have to do everything correctly for this plant to grow and to survive. Same thing with the bees. You know, you could see a beehive in a cavity that's been there for years, but if you want to be a beekeeper, now you have to learn all these aspects and variables and things that can go wrong and it's all in your control. So being a, an agriculture-based livestock concept, there's so much to learn before you take it on. Yeah. And, and I took a class because, and it's funny because I'm usually a, a, a impatient person and I'm like, no, just let me learn as I go. But I knew I had time because I knew in spring, that's when I was going to get my bees. So I took a class and there was so much information, uh, you know, and it was sort of like, I can't retain it all, but it was, you know, good handouts, but I still was like, I'm, I'm confused. So if someone wants bees, when is the time to get them? What is the basic setup? And like Tina mentioned, she says her hive might have been in the wrong place. Where should people place their hive? And when should they sort of check? And I know this is a lot of, you know, I mean, each of those things could be a whole entire hour on itself. But um, just go through the time frame, basic setup and location of where someone should put a hive. Anyone? <laughs> Bueller. <laughs> Bueller. Blake, how about you take it? <laughs> um. There's definitely some things to consider in terms of zoning laws. If you're in Sacramento County, they require you to have a six foot fence for the bees to fly over. That way it gets them up over people's heads. They don't fly directly into your neighbor's faces. Interesting. Kind of like an airport. Yeah. They take off and then they fly out. Also we need to be conscious of putting out a water source for the bees. Mm. And also be cognizant. If it's a shady place, then the bees are not going to wake up as early. And if it's warmer, the honey is going to be made faster because they're able to dehydrate the nectar and they're going to be out working earlier in the morning because the sun's going to wake them up. But it also means their hive is going to be warmer and they're going to be spending more time gathering water to cool the hive. So a balance of that, I like to have a morning sun to get them up early and going uh -huh. and then evening shade. So in the heat of the day, they get a little bit of relief um, and then a little bit more sun in the uh, before sunset. Because you figure in a, in a tree cavity, these bees never see the light of day until they fly outside. So the, the more you can insulate that environment for them is that much less work that they have to do. And then pointing your entrance towards the, the east so they catch that sunrise, that gets them up and going earlier. And if I know if I have my hives next to a road or a sidewalk or a neighbor with a, a dog, I'll try and point my entrance away from that to encourage the bees to take off into my yard and, and go from there. Yeah. I, I sort of sound like a bee. I need the sunrise. I need to be warm, but then midday, right. <laughs> like, I mean, that, that does sound sort of just, you know, like what you would think. And I, I know when my last hive, I'm wandering around the property going where, where, because I know I had um, some bees bearding and that's when they come out during the real heat. Right. And they start just cooling themselves. Is that correct? Right. Mm-hmm. Regulating their own temperature inside the 
you know, hive. Yeah. I always feel bad because I mean, it's so hot. Um, so I am always looking for that midday shade, which isn't always easy necessarily. I mean, you think, oh yeah, I could find it, but then you're like, no. And then if you put it up against a wall towards midday, that's extra heat rating off of a wall. So that's something, you know, it's just like a plant, you know, a plant could take full sun, but if you put it right up against a wall, it's going to have extra radiated heat. And I imagine we want to lift the bee box up off of the ground. Oh, oh lifting them. Yeah. So I can reach them. Okay. So, yeah, okay. A lot of people have the stands, you know, but mm -hmm. you don't want it to be too high because the more boxes you have, it's really hard, especially as you get older, like me, it's, it's too high and too heavy to lift, you know, up and Got it. off. Got it. Okay. So I just have like cinder blocks because I've never gotten really tall. So the first bottom box, what do you call that first bottom box? Those are going to be your brood boxes. Okay. Anything with, and you could have anywhere from one to two brood boxes in there, depending on the size of the hive. Okay. So you have the, the, the box and then inside you have the frames and I've always gotten frames with pre wax on them. Is that a good idea? Or do you like to let your bees even build out their wax? I like the already made with the, you know, pre-wax sheets. Yeah, yeah. And they build, then they build on that on and build their own comb on it. Okay. But better yet is that if you have a beekeeper friend and you're just getting started, you go, oh, you think I could have a frame, an empty frame to help my queen get started, meaning started laying. So, so one know, that's already see. has its comb built on it? Yes. And that's okay? You don't need to worry about them, like, sniffing other people's <laughs> Oh, oh, no, they'll be attracted to it. They'll, they'll be, be attracted. attracted. Okay. Okay. All they're right. Very, very grateful. Okay. Because it's just, they're like, it's sort of like buying a, a condo already furnished. You don't Correct. have to buy the furniture. Correct. Okay. Okay. Yes. I wasn't sure because I try. you know, I heard that and I took some frames out, but one, I don't know how long, long you should, you know, I, I have some and they're pretty old. I imagine if there's mold or if they've been sitting around for a while, you don't want to use them. They'll clean them up. Really? Wow. What good. that really damages them is temperature. If you put them in the freezer, they'll dry out and get too brittle and they'll break apart. Or if they get too warm, they'll start to warp. Okay. All right. I would never even thought about putting them in the freezer, but I bet people do that to kill off. They think they're killing off any larvae or anything. Yes. Yeah, 72 hours is a good time to keep frames in the freezer okay. to kill off any, any pests, but then the anything longer than that starts to deteriorate the wax quality. Okay. So your bottom box, so you have it lifted a little mm -hmm. bit. You have your brood box, you have your frames, um, wax or ones like from a friend. So it's already built out. And then is that the basics or do you need that box above it? Well, there's the bottom board. That's kind of like the, the floor of the hive. And okay. then the boxes go on top of that. And then on top is a a lid or a, or a top board mm -hmm. and there's different migra there's different covers i use a migratory cover which has a, a little notch in the top to allow a little bit of airflow to come out the top and it also serves as a second entrance that i can open or close depending on the time of year okay and then so in the brood box that's where they're going to be the, the queen you're going to release your bees into there and you buy you get your bees like in spring right yes in spring yes. And then you release them into there and then they're going to spend a good amount of time building comb. And then, but in the meantime, she's going to be busy laying. Yes. She's going to be busy laying. And in the then, condo. Oh, in yeah. the condo. Yes. And that's already furnished ideally in the condo. And then when do they start making honey? They won't make honey until they have a, enough wax built to start to store it. And okay. They're focused on building, building, building all the way up until the, the summer solstice. And then once the summer solstice hits, the queen will start to decrease her laying. And then the bees will begin to backfill that space with honey. And that way the population decreases down to a manageable winter cluster size to match the amount of food they're backfilling in there. Okay. So they'll put the honey in the same brew box. Yes. And so store. Mostly on the edges and the sides of maybe a frame, you know, because... Typically, you'll see the queen laying kind of there's a certain pattern. You know, there's some frames are all filled uh -huh. with eggs and then, you know, it'll be capped over. You know, and usually, you know, it takes 21 days for a new worker bee to be born. 
Okay. So the, the whole thing is she keeps laying and then the babies work. Then the, the teenagers go guard and then the adults go and forage. There's these different stages of their lives. Got it. So from when you get your bees and you put them in there to the summer solstice, how many inspections is a good idea roughly to do? I know because I, I think some people really want to look at their bees and other people like me who are like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to disturb them. What's sort of a sweet spot? Which should you be looking for from when you release them to the summer solstice? I'd like to do every 10 to 12 days because a queen can be, fo be formed in 14 days. Okay. And if another queen's emerging, there's a chance that your, your hive's going to swarm with half your bees. They're going to take off. Got so I don't it. want half my bees to take off. I want them to stay to build comb and be workers to gather honey for me. And, and Tina, are you looking for that second queen? Uh, yeah, to see if there's anything uh, yet yeah, they're busy and they're like, hmm, they suspect that she is um, not going to make it or there's something wrong with her. They may build some more cells and yeah, you want to look for that queen cell. In fact, last week we found larva in one and they hadn't capped it over yet. And like, oh, that's interesting. But yet there's a lot of, you know, capped a brood so she's strong but what are they thinking you know why, why are they building another uh, queen how, how so, do you how, how do you know there's another queen going on it's this the shape of the cell that they're creating got it's it longer and it's you know could be towards the bottom of a frame wow you guys are really inspecting yours my whole thing was just try not to squish them you guys are really getting in there. Do you guys both use um, smoke when you inspect or you, do you have calm bees? <laughs> I, I have a mix of bees because we do a lot of cutouts and a lot of swarm rescues. Uh -huh. So my stock is very diversified in terms of genetics, which yeah. tend to bring out it's different like, behaviors. You no, know, You know how you're referring to the condos? So yes. if there's several condos, there's several different types of neighbors. Yes. You no. have the really sweet neighbor uh -huh. that will offer you, you know, help. And then the one that's, that's moody, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you don't really talk to. So those are like the bees. Yes. Well, no, the mm -hmm. reason I ask is my first hive because, you know, I was never afraid of bees and I always heard, oh, you know, if you don't bother bees and I watched the beekeepers, my first hive completely docile, super nice. My second hive assholes big jerks. Oh. And I don't know why. I mean, I, they stung me through. Yeah. We tried to Joe's giving me the smoke. Like what Joe? Oh, Joe. that's right. Joe thinks he pissed him off because I thought I had him in the sun too much and I needed to move them and I had him vacuum them. <laughs> What? Yeah, we vacuumed the bees. <laughs> That'll do it. That's the yeah. There's nothing that pisses bees off more than being vacuumed. Yeah. So yeah, I forgot about that because I didn't do it. I had Joe do it, but I think they were assholes before. Anyways, you think they would have? Okay. Yeah, but anyways, but then when I went out, they stung me through uh, gloves and my my suit and I had a reaction. I'm not allergic, but I had a reaction. And at that point, I'm like. No. And then like Joe would go out and, uh, unfortunately the bee suit I had, he's really tall. It was too short. So it got him too around the ankles. And at that point I'm like, you guys are not nice bees. I'm sorry. We vacuumed, but so there, and then, um, I was running by, uh, some sunflower fields and I'm not afraid of bee boxes. And I did get, get stung. And someone said sunflower bees are known to be a little more, uh, territorial. I agree with that. Really? Because they're in the sun all day? What? I don't know why. No idea. But anecdotally, when I'm out in the fields, that the sunflower bees have been the worst. Interesting. Wow. And I ran by some today. And as I saw them, I'm like, oh, remember, go, you know, wide path. That is interesting. Um, hmm. You know, I think a lot of behavior in terms of when we do cutouts, we'll see open air colonies or colonies that have access from like rodents or other raccoons, we'll see those bees act a lot more defensive because we know they're exposed to those pest pressures at night. And so we go to remove the hive during the day 
And we see that symptom of that, that pressure that makes them more disturbed and defensive. Got it. Yeah. That's so another thing that could come into effect as well as the health of the hive. If they have enough food, you know, that's more for them to defend or if okay. they're starving, that makes them a little bit more testy, kind of like an animal that's wounded. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm like, sort of like me. Or, you know, I'm like, like Marlene, when you get hungry, yeah. you get hangry. I was just about to say, just literally like me, if something's annoying me, I'm going to be more annoyed, like to everyone in general. Um, mm -hmm. So getting back, you say, uh, Blake, that you have a lot of different uh, genetics. So you know, sort of the attitude of your bees. Tina, do you, you smoke every time or, or none? No. No. Okay. No, because if you're just going to look at the top, uh -huh. you just take a little quick peek. Yeah. And just kind of see how they're acting and like, oh, th these guys are a little testy. Uh huh. Uh, so yeah, then, then we'll bring out the smoke, but I'm like, why light up if I don't have to, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just taking a quick peek, but if I'm going to do a full like inspection and go down farther, then yeah, I'll use some smoke. Okay. And you always do it at, at morning or night? Um, no, not night. Usually no. in the middle of the day. Middle of the day. The okay. Foragers are out and about. And Got it. Okay. Less they're out and about, so there are fewer bees. Okay. That makes sense. But, you know, everybody's different. I don't know, Blake, when do you usually do it? Blake will say, when I have time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that or late, late morning is the best time. Like Tina said, that's when most of the bees are out, out okay. foraging. And I like to have the smoker going. And I'll usually put one puff in. Like if I'm going to inspect six hives, I'll get the smoker going and I'll put one or two puffs and I'll walk the line, I hit them all. And then I'll wait for five or 10 minutes and then I'll start to open lids and I'll keep the smoker there as a contingency, but that's pretty much all the smoke I'll use on an inspection. And I give them three chances. If they're mean to me three times, then I'll kill their <laughs> queen and combine them with a hive that I like oh. or give them a frame to make a new queen from genetics that I like. Okay. So you're sort of uh, just messing with their combining just so you get the genetics and the the, the attitudes I'm looking that you to, want. Yeah, I'm looking <laughs> to keep those traits. And I'd, I'd rather have docile bees across the board. Uh -huh. and it's not worth it for me to have a, a super productive line of bees. Yeah. And even if they are defensive, I'd rather keep bees that are a little bit nicer and, and more manageable. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't realize. I mean, but, but I mean, I like what you said about you you have to look about what's sort of going on in their life and give them a little bit of benefit, you know, the doubt that maybe they have a little bit tougher life than the ones that are, have no rodent problems, no ant problems. Nice. Um, but you still, know, being in touch, being in touch with I the local to forest who helps. Sorry, go ahead, Tina. I'm sorry. As I listen to us, it sounds like we're in therapy with the bees. <laughs> this is therapy for me because it was very traumatic for my, my second bees. Um, <laughs> So this year I, I just took the bee boxes, moved them to a spot and I put some lemongrass hoping I would catch a, just a swarm because lemongrass, they're attracted to lemongrass scent. Is that correct? Yeah. The lemongrass oil is part the, part of what the queen pheromone is made of. Uh, oh, oh, but really? The same, ter same terpenes. Yeah. Okay. I didn't get a swarm. I did not. I'm, I'm, I'm not heartbroken, but I'll do it. You know, I'll add more lemongrass next year. Um, do you guys, okay. So going back to the setup, sorry, I was jumping around to just because I had to have therapy about my, my vacuuming the bees and all that. <laughs> um, you don't harvest honey the first year or do you? I think around here, if you get started early enough, mm -hmm. um, it's the thing, if you order a bee package, mm -hmm. they're not going to arrive until April or May because they, the commercial beekeepers take their hives out to pollination contracts in February and March. And then February and March are done. Now March and April are here. Now the beekeepers are managing these large swelling hives and that's what they take the bees from to make packages. And they also have a, a round of queens that they rear and breed and they pair up one of those queens with each package that is sent out. So if you look at the forage in Sacramento area, a large bulk of our forage starts in February and it wraps up in May whenever the heat comes. So generally, if you order packages, your packages are arriving the same time all your food is supply is disappearing in the valley. So a lot of people feed their bee sugar water to use those calories to build the wax comb. And the comb is their equity. And once the comb is built, then next year, the bees will be able to fill it effectively to have a surplus that can be harvested from. 
But if you get a swarm here in March, you got bees that are rocking and rolling and their swarms are comb building machines. And you'll, you'll have a good chance of getting honey this year if you get a, a swarm in March or April, as opposed to waiting for April. That's why we're all excited <laughs> come spring. All the beekeepers that want to get swarms. Yeah. So let's talk, talk about- talk to each other a lot, huh, Blake? Yes. Well, I mean, it was during a commercial break, Tina gets a call and I'm like, what's going on? That sounds pretty serious. And it's it was a, a well, this wasn't a swarm, but it just goes to show you uh, this time of year or early spring, there was a, a bee truck that overturned. Was that it, Tina? Oh, yeah. Blake, remember I called you on that one? Yep. During commercial yeah, he got break. He got, he got several calls on that one. <laughs> Tina's like, I'm about to go live on air. Uh, let, let me go ahead and connect you with, I'm like, oh my gosh. So let's talk about swarm. So, um, last year I was telling you, Joe, I was at work, Joe heard one swarm and then we had another one and everyone's like, well, why don't you go and capture it? And I said, you know, these bees have a better chance of probably surviving on their own than if I get them because I killed two hives so far. Um, but I think People are confused about what a swarm is. I think they think it's going to be where they put their hive. So when they see a swarm on something, they're like, well, I can't have a, a beehive right there. Uh, that doesn't make sense. So uh, Blake, Tina, can you go through and describe sort of, you sort of already set it up, but what is a swarm, uh, what people should look for, what they should do, and what's going on in a swarm? All right, Blake, it's yours. <laughs> <laughs> when the uh the bees come out of winter successfully then they want to start building and they'll build to until the point where they fill their cavity and if that's the size of a shoebox, then it'll take them maybe two weeks to fill up and then they're going to send out a swarm that's about the size of a, of a football maybe and then other times you have hives that may build in a in like a composting bin and that hive won't fill up that cavity until april and once it's full in april then they send out a massive swarm from that area. So the swarms often coincide with the amount of forage and rain. And this year was pretty exceptional because we had rain about every two weeks, just enough to keep the forage going. I saw vetch growing for almost six months this year out there. Um, so they have enough food, they start growing a population. Now they need to split into, into two. And what will happen is they'll start making a new queen in the hive. And right before that queen emerges, the old queen will take off with about half of the bees in the hive. Oh. And the reason the old queen leaves, that's so she can start laying immediately when they land in a new location. Because the young queen has to go mature, get mated, and then come back and even mature further to be ready to start laying eggs. And if the new queen were to be the one swarming, all the bees would die by the time that queen got mature enough to start laying eggs. So once they find a location to move into, if the they'll start building the wax comb and then once it's about one or two millimeters tall the queen will actually start laying in there and they'll build the cell out as the larva grows so they don't waste any time and the bees will actually empty out as much honey from the hive as they can before they leave oh they put it in their honey stomach and they use that to start building comb so it takes about seven pounds of honey to make one pound of wax so it's really important that they bring as much honey, basically as much supply as they, as they can to start this new, new adventure. And when people see the swarm, the swarm moves two to three times generally. So the first move is the swarm leaving the hive and they land usually about 15 to 20 yards from the hive and they kind of get their act together, collect everybody together. And now they're gonna move within a quarter of a mile, half mile, three quarters of a mile. And this is, to put distance between them and the parent colony uh, because they don't want to compete for the same food and same forage. So the second move, that objective is to get them away from competition and also to diversify genetics. And the third move is them moving into a final location. And after they move the second time far away, they'll spend anywhere from six to 48 hours in that location while they send scouts out to pick an appropriate place to move into. It could be a chimney, it could be a tree cavity, it could be a car, it could be a composting bin. I'm sure you've seen all sorts of fun videos moving into couches and different places. 
So once they find that spot, then they're going to move in and start building comb and establish. And usually people see that middle, that middle transit time when they land. And people think, oh, a beehive is forming on this tree. I want someone to come get it. But they don't think they realize that it, that's just going to be a quick stop for them. They're taking a pit stop. They're tired. Yeah. So then, when you, when you see it look like, like you said, just sort of a football of bees sort of draped and there's no cavity and there's no place that's, that's the swarm. And that's only going to be there. Like you said, when they're sending scouts out, um, for a bit and mine were, I, I think I, maybe I asked you and you said, oh yeah, they'll probably be gone in about two days. And sure enough, they were gone in two days. And that's kind of a good and a bad thing. It's good that they can not be bothered and left to go move into a new place on their own. Um, but if it's in the city, mm -hmm. oftentimes that's a, a structure or it's a place where they might not survive the winter. A lot of times they'll set up in trees in the open air on a branch and they'll do that in April when the weather's nice and cool and they'll start to build comb. They'll start to store a little bit of honey in there. And then what happens when the heat comes, all that comb gets really soft, but it still has to carry all the weight. So oftentimes it'll It'll dislodge itself and fall from the tree and hit the ground. Oh. So this is where this is where you guys come in, and this is what you like, um, because people will call you and say, "I have a swarm" or "I have a hive." And so when when they're in swarm, I've heard that they're very docile and fine. But if you come across them building a hive, are they still docile, or are they a little more like, "Nope, this is going to be our permanent home. Don't mess with us." Well, since they consume so much honey on their, their exodus when they leave to swarm, it causes their, their stomachs to be a little bit distended. Mm -hmm. So they, even if they want to sting you, it's hard for them to curl it around because they're, they're so bloated with honey. So it, it's more physically difficult for them to get you. But they also have no brood to defend, no hive to defend when they're in a swarm mode. And every bee has a little bit of honey inside that they're going to use to build comb. So those bees know that if they start stinging, they're going to die and they're not going to be able to use that honey to contribute to the new wax building. And also they, they use the, the bodies of the bee as a thermal mask, kind of like penguins do in the winter. But they stay warm. So they, they cycle into the middle of the cluster to stay warm. And if they get too hot, they can cycle back out to the outside. And you'll even see the queen doing it, diving in and out of the cluster, trying to keep her temperature you know, con uh, consistent. So that's the reason they ball up like that for protection and to keep the thermal uh, thermal regulation consistent as well. I had no idea about the honey tummy. That's, yeah, call uh, honey, that's honey honey tummy. I know I'm going to start calling it when I eat too much and get bloated. I'm just going to call it a honey tummy. I mean, yeah. I'll be like, it's my honey tummy. I'm too <laughs> tired to even be mean right now. <laughs> uh, Joe, Joe, stop looking at me. Uh, they can almost carry their, their own weight in that stomach. That's crazy. So when you see bees coming back, if you do a slow motion shot of a beehive entrance, you'll see bees flying in flat. And other times you'll see them with their butt hanging down. It's just because it's literally so heavy. It's dragging, almost like a boat dragging in the water. You'll see them just oh, dragging that butt. That's so cool. Uh, Tina, do you remember the first swarm that you, you rescued? I think I went to observe one you know, and kind of learn. It's best when you're a beginner to go out with someone who's done it before and then you can watch the yeah. technique, mm -hmm. you know? Um, you know, like this season, there was one that was really high and I called Blake to help out, you know, because, you know, he's what, how tall are you, 6'2 or 6'3? You know, compared to my 5'6 and I'm like, I, I need help. I can't even reach these guys and they were just stuck to that lemon tree like crazy, you know, and it was, uh, they were, they were stubborn girls cause uh -huh. they, uh, went in the box after he got them. And the next day they went back on the branch, they oh. left the box went back on the branch anyway. So it was one of those things, but yeah, when you're, when you're starting out, it's good to observe and kind of know what you need, what tools you need to go get the swarm. It's always best. Like if someone calls, Hi, um, are you so and so? Uh, yeah, I have a swarm, but they'll, they they won't know exactly what to call it. But it's usually a swarm, mm -hmm. uh, not a hive. Uh, and then um, you you should ask as a beekeeper, ask okay, where, how high, uh, what's it look like? Describe the shape. Does it look like a football, soccer ball? You know, is it small? Um, and then take a picture and then text it to me. 
you know, is it hard to get to on the property? Like if it's in a, oh, they're going in and out of my garage in a crevice in my garage. Oh, that's a different type of rescue. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what Blake is um, expert at is uh, trapping out or cutting out. And me, I just like the easy ones on the tree, you know, that I can reach or, in, and they're like in a bush. In fact, the first one I got this season this lady called, it was her birthday. She was beyond excited that there were bees in her backyard and she wanted to do good for the environment. And she goes, oh my goodness, what a great birthday surprise. I got bees. And she called me and it was right there at four feet in a bush. And she watched the whole time, took a million videos and pictures, <laughs> so excited. And, and, and it turns out that particular hive was um, end of March, I believe. And this queen is laying like crazy and has produced so much honey. But then you have another one that I might've gotten in March and they're slower, you know, she lays slower. They're just, they're just not fast enough. And so they don't build as much honey. So it just depends, like Blake says on, you know, the genetics and everything. And, and I don't know why one queen lays faster than the other, you know, when they're neighbors, they're next door to each other, condo next door to condo, but it's so much fun. And, and Blake and I had lunch a while back and we were like, why do we like to do this? You know, it's just so much fun. Wouldn't you agree, Blake? I can't get enough. What? <laughs> what? No, you got to tell Marlene about the big plan this weekend. What? What's the big plan this weekend? We're doing an educational kind of on-site demonstration on a cutout. And a cutout is when we have an established hive and a structure. Oh, yeah. So we're, this building is actually abandoned and kind of falling apart so it'd be pretty interesting but it's a it's an older commercial beekeepers property and he's since passed away and this equipment's been just sitting and what it's happened it's attracted swarm after swarm after swarm and they've moved into the cavities of this building and almost every wall is full of oh. honeycomb and beehives and to the point where they've filled up the entire wall oh. and they're actually building outside now and there's there's about a three by three foot hive hanging outside the wall that they've already filled. So we're going to have separate teams break up with different crews and then document each hive removal. And then we'll capture data from each one and we'll kind of observe how much honey they have, how much pollen they have. We'll do some mite tests to see if we can find any varroa mites and see what the numbers are on there. So here's a question. When you have a wall or walls, do you look to determine how many hives there are? Do you have to look for how many queens there are? So are you looking for queens or is there a way to denote that if you're in a wall that there's individual hives? Like, will there be separate space in between? I'm Typically, there's only single hives in structures. Okay. Um, this is kind of a unique situation because being abandoned, there was nobody there to observe it occurring and accumulating throughout the years. But typically, there's one and we'll identify the entrance. And after that, we'll either use the thermal imaging to get a heat source to see where the, the comb is underneath the wall. And then we'll cut that section out according to size because we need the whole thing exposed to be able to remove the comb. Cause we want to get the comb out gently so we can put it into empty frames and then not disturb their, their progress in building. Okay. So they'll, they'll, they prefer their own. If you can move that, their own comb into a frame, that's, that's nicer. Indeed. It smells like home and that's their equity. A yeah. drawn comb is, so much work and effort that went yeah. into building that. Um, so a few, few questions going back to the swarm. Do you, when they're all swarming and you're getting them, are you just looking for the queen? If you get the queen, will the bees follow behind? Oh yeah. Okay. Yep, that's the, uh, it, typically I like to, if it's on a branch and you can cut the branch, we can you know snap it off gently and then lower the whole cluster into a hive and close it up. Um, other times we have to maybe shake the branch to get it off because it's a, a branch that we're not allowed to cut or it would, you know, we don't want to injure a tree uh -huh. uh, making our cuts. So you either scoop them off by hand. Um, I very rarely use the vacuum, uh, <laughs> but spotting the queen is the best way to get a swarm. So once you get her, you put her into the queen cage and then put that into the hive and the rest will follow. And it, it makes it pretty effortless. And she's very noticeable because she's much bigger. She is bigger, but she stops laying three or four days before she swarms because 
she needs to shorten up essentially mm. she needs to get lose some weight before they fly um, <laughs> if, it, if then, it was only that easy <laughs> Blake, are you telling her the queen <laughs> to lose weight <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh, what we do with swarms that have um when the when the bees get forced out of a, an area or the bees swarm before the queen's ready what we'll see is bees on the ground because the queen is essentially a glider at that point. She can't fly up. She can only fly out and down. So when you see bees on the ground, you can probably assume it's going to be a fat queen because she's still pregnant. Uh, all, all the bees, all the queen bees store sperm on their initial mating flight, but they can choose to stop insemination. So essentially they're not pregnant for a time and that allows them to be shorter. And then the reverse happens when the swarm gets into a new cavity. The bees start building comb and she'll start inseminating the eggs. And after three or four days, she'll start booting up again and, and repeating the process. Crazy. So you get the, you get the uh, queen once you locate her and then you just have a new, new box. Now, I guess my question is if you're, you have your bees and you need to personally divide your bees but you already said that it's a good idea to move them away because there'll be competition. So say you have a bee box and you need to divide it. It, it's okay to keep it local. Absolutely. Okay. There's enough, there's enough forage here in, and I say here being in Sacramento area, mm -hmm. if you're in a, in a urban setting, you're going to have forage for pretty much the, the full season. But if you're in like Davis or Winters or if you're in Folsom or the Foothills or Wilton, Elk Grove, um, Lincoln, those places are really going to drop off in the amount of food supply they have because of all the open land, it's all native forage and everything really shuts down out there in the summer. As opposed to here, everyone's got their squash going, everyone's got their sunflowers or dahlias or zinnias. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, depending on the food supply, it will dictate how many hives you can have in it's almost like, like you said, a condo or an apartment building. You have all these people crammed into this one giant building, but nobody goes, you know, you're not going into your neighbor's house by mistake all the time. So the, even though the bees are close together, they know what hive is there. And there is some drift event every now and then bees will go to the wrong hive, but that's it, not a very common, common problem. Okay. Uh, Tina, what, what is your, um, what was your most problematic swarm collection? Let's see. Hmm. Kind of the one I described earlier, that lemon tree. But the one I also did this year was it was all over a lady's tire on her van, her mommy van. She called, a neighbor called actually, and it was on the back of the rear tire, just covered, you know. Wow. Um, so that was it was fun, but yet it took a little while because they were a little confused because I just couldn't scrape them. You know what I mean? Because they were right on the tire. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I really, I tried to get a lot of them. I just gently kind of moved them in the box. And then they started smelling the rest of the frames, the empty frames, because they were already built out and they had the scent of, you know, honey and just, oh, there's a condo I, I like, you know? Got it. Rather than the tire. Okay. And then they started crawling in. So wow. it's kind of fun to watch them crawl in. Yeah. Like, oh. They just start. And you go, oh, I think I got her. I think I got the queen. Because I'm not an expert in always trying to find her right away in that big old cluster. You know? uh -huh. they're, okay. they're, I'm sure Blake is much better. Like, oh, there she is. Then grabs her with a queen clip. And then you take that and you put her in the box. And then they you know her scent. They follow. And they just march on in. Oh, wow. So were they marching in even before you found the queen just because of the scent of the honeycomb already built out? Um, they, I put the, the frame uh, near the tire uh -huh. and laid it on the tire and yes, they were starting to crawl on it. So I just kind of held it there and waited for them to get on the frame. Wow. What and then, then I turned it over to do on the other side and, and then I put it in the box and I did another one. Cause you know, a little, little box that I have is only five frames. Mm -hmm. So then I, I got a lot of them on there. I thought, okay, well, let's see. I'll put the box real close to that and they can smell the other ones and they, and they, they all communicate with each other by, you know, sticking their rear ends in the air and kind of doing a little fanning like, Hey, we're in here now. This is a great condo. I checked it out, you know, uh, no, uh, major CCNRs and all, whatever, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so they, um, they start crawling in 
And I'm like, well, I hope I got her. I didn't look closely enough and, and it was getting darker. Mm-hmm. So here I am sitting in the car because I'm waiting for, you know, the rest of them to go in and I'm like, oh, enough of this. So I just wrapped it up in a sheet because I had, I put the sheet down on the ground and the poor lady, I said, just go to bed. <laughs> yeah. She's like a new mom. Just go to bed. I'll just text you when I leave. But I was sitting in the car and another neighbor came home and I'm thinking, here I am in this white suit yep. mm-hmm. sitting in a car by myself on a, on a neighbor's block anyway. So finally got him and then just left. Yeah. It was you're lucky I mean, the cops I, there's weren't so called. many. I, what's that? You say you're lucky the cops weren't called. <laughs> exactly. Explain yourself. Yeah. It's not a, not a natural process either putting bees into a box because normally the bees have to have an 80% quorum and agree on a location to move into. So when you're putting them into a box, you're making that decision for them. So there's some confusion because you'll, you'll see them putting the pheromones out to attract other bees in there, but it's still not part of their program because they didn't decide this. So you can, you can almost see the internal conflict they have. They're so grateful for this box and it's getting end late in the day. It's like, okay, I guess we'll take it. And... <laughs> yeah. So a um, few things, if you have scouting bees out, um, when you go and get a swarm, I imagine you don't get all of them and those poor bees they'll die or do they jump onto other swarm somewhere they generally don't okay group up with anybody else yeah yeah yeah. so there's going to be a slight i mean you're not going to get all of them what if you didn't get the queen what will happen to those those bees will they make a new queen or will they die or will they go off they won't make it either the best thing to do if you if you get home and you figure out you got a queenless swarm the best thing to do is to combine them with one of your stronger hives Okay. So then they'll, they'll go. It's amazing how adaptable they really are actually to different scents. Um, Sometimes in a tree cavity, you'll have three or four different cavities. mm -hmm. And sometimes those cavities will decompose so much that they'll actually join. So there are times when you have colonies that are actually put together, combined in nature, or a tree would, a tree limb will break and that breaks open the barrier between the two hives. Now the two hives have access to each other. Interesting. So there are times in nature where that might occur as well. And they've, they've adapted. And when we're doing swarms, I think this year we had it happen three times. We had uh, marked queens in our swarm. So someone in the area had purchased a queen from a breeder, put them in the hive, and then now that hive was not managed, and then they swarmed. Oh, got it. Wow. You know what we mean by marked queen? Uh, no. I thought I well, did. They, mar- <laughs> they mark them to know what year they're Okay. So, they're born. so the acronym goes, will you raise good bees? White, red, or white, yellow, raise. red, green, blue. <laughs> okay. So, so I, I thought that's what it was marked, but then I'm like, wait a minute. I don't want to sound like an idiot. That's like if you buy a, a, a new newbie, uh-huh. plus a package of bees, uh, typically whoever's selling the bees will mark the mark, queen. Yes. So you know, and, then, yes. and then they stand out like when you look at them, but mm-hmm. You know, but if you're getting a swarm, they're not, you know, majority yeah. of the time they're not marked and they're just uh, like, you know, like when you catch feral cats. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Put it in something I understand. Yes. Yeah. Feral cats. Like, okay. You know, she's cat lady. Yeah. She's cat yeah, lady. Yeah. yeah. Or she's yeah. rescuing cats. So uh-huh. when you get a cat and you like, figure out who the mom cat, you're not going to mark her with a pen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh how do you, you know, you oh, know what, sometimes no we literally we, well well we you do know that they cut the ear tips so you know yes. they're been fixed so you don't retrap them yeah it's like that it's yeah. like putting yeah. some kind of physical mark on them so you know what it is yeah so well I, I know when I got my bees they always have the queen in the little cage and she does have like a dot on her and then she has like the the marshmallow that is the seal and by the time she eats away the marshmallow right then she exits yep yeah so and that's why we don't uh that's why we don't just discard our weak swarms in the beginning because you may have some killer genetics mm-hmm. but that queen may be on her fourth season and you may be observing symptoms of old age and you might discard it but if you just let them go for a little while let them requeen themselves mm-hmm. with those genetics then you might really have something neat or you can buy a queen because we know people who make the queens humbly. Indeed. So that's another <laughs> thing too. It's like buying a, you know, adopting dogs from the pound. You know, they're going to be mutts, mixed genetics. If you're buying queens from a breeder, 
they're verified genetics. You know exactly what you're getting. So you're like buying a jalapeno, it doesn't turn into a bell pepper. Like you know what you're buying, you know what the end product's gonna be. And that's really, really valuable in terms of what to expect when you're buying bees. Yeah, so that's another thing too. If you realize you have a queenless swarm, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of bees, not a small, you know, a lot, like it's bigger than a football. It's like worth saving. It's covering, you know, four or five frames. You go, I need to get a queen. You call that queen breeder and you go, I want to buy a queen. Yeah, I've you know? seen on Facebook, I follow the Sacramento beekeeper or is it Sacramento? I think they just changed the name of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and I often see people when they say they've checked their hives, they say, I have no queen. Does anyone have a brooded queen? Is that correct? And Mated they, ones, yeah. Yeah. Mated queen. So they, yeah. they're looking for a queen because their queen and their hive is gone. And so if they get a mated queen and they put it in there, then it'll, re, it'll, it'll keep the hive going. It will, but it'll never be the same because the genetics that were in that queen before were from the, the mother and the father bee. And now that you've purchased or even let your own bees make a new one, you're still introducing the other side of genetics, the the father's side. Got it. Got it. Which is fascinating to me because if, when a bee, when a queen lays an egg, she, she can intentionally fertilize it, which causes that egg to turn into a female. If she does not fertilize it, that bee is a male until it turns into a drone. So if you think about the genetic input, it's weird that the female queen is laying an egg without any other genetic input and then that turns into a male. So it's almost like she's giving birth to a clone, but of a different sex. That's insane. (laughs) They're really fascinating. It's really, really fascinating and and just amazing. I mean, the everything, I mean, uh, I just keep learning. Every time I talk to people about bees, there's just more and more and more to learn. Um, just because I'm interested in my, my tree hive, if so, say the hive's been in the same walnut tree for 10 years, uh, how many Queens has it gone through? Depends on the size of the cavity. If it's like a, a shoebox size cavity, I bet you they cast, you know, two or three swarms a year. So that's two or three Queens a year. Okay. Got it. So, but it's, it's still considered the same hive and the genetics will still be the same. Yeah. Kind of like, you know, people grow up and, mm-hmm. you know, their parents pass away and they may keep the house and then they have kids in their, that same mm-hmm. house and, you know, Got the it. same, same condo, house. Blake, condo. <laughs> <laughs> in this case, it's a house. Cause it's a standalone. <laughs> oh, yeah. Family dwelling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> When does swarm season calm down or is it constant because, uh, swarm season, then there's hot, uh, does it just morph into hives? Do you guys just always go in finding these hives that are in dwellings? The swarms kind of shut down around the 4th of July, really, because that's when the solstice happens and the bees are more attentive to the photo period of the day than they are temperature or anything else. Because temperature will fluctuate, everything fluctuates, but photo period will not. And so when they're growing and growing and growing mode, that's when the swarming happens. But now the queen starts to, to slow down her laying and the bees are able to start backfilling. And then they start focusing on that. So when bees move into places like in a tree or a rooftop in the spring, oftentimes when the heat comes, you'll start seeing the absconsions. So the swarm calls slowly turn into cutouts. And then when the heat comes, you got all these absconsion calls coming. And that's when you see um, bees on the ground because those bees had to evacuate on a, on a short notice. And that's when the queens didn't get a chance to shorten up. So just by knowing where the bee swarm is can kind of give you some insight as to what might be happening before you even show up and put eyes on it. Okay. So say you get a swarm call in, and it's a true swarm, say in September, you won't just assume that it's bad genetics or they're sick they it could possibly be something else right it could be a swarm in, in that time of year because the there, there's a flow a nectar okay. flow on okay. that time of year okay I, I, yeah i would just be like like hmm this is august they're not supposed to be doing this there's something wrong with this yeah, swarm. exactly swarm um and you you said that you're checking for mites in this one that you're doing this this weekend do you ever come across um, do you check the swarms for mites? Is there a way or, or 
before? Not so much the swarms. Okay. Uh, we'll we'll perform mite checks on the swarms after we get them into a hive back at the yard. Because we have different places we put bees to well, kind of want to quarantine them when we put them into a hive. I don't want to introduce um, a hive to the, the apiary that might be vectoring a disease or, or pests. So we'll have a place where we can sequester them and then make sure they're clean of the mites. So are, tr are, are the mites as bad? Um, I was talking to another uh, beekeeper and she said her genetics are pretty good. And she thinks therefore that uh, that's why she doesn't have mite issues. And so, you know, it's like anything else. If you're stressed and weak, you might be more susceptible to things. Um, Tina, have you ever had uh, mites and how often do you check for mites and what is your treatment for mites? You know, when Blake was talking about how he inspects every, what, 10 to 12 days or mm -hmm. something like that. Hey, we're going to go inspect some of the hives and look, you look on the bottom board, see if there's any mite evidence, if there's movement or anything, but uh, you just kind of have to pay attention closely. And uh, many of us treat for mites. Doesn't hurt the bees, doesn't hurt the honey, and depending on what you use, um, because you know the mites can kill the the bees and the whole mess the whole hive up, and it's just awful. What do you treat um, for? W with what? What do you use? Because I got confused. Just, I w I was oh, confused. <laughs> you were confused with what? What to treat or pre-treat with? There's different uh, types of treatments mm -hmm. available, and we used to use these strips a long time ago, but this year we're trying fogging. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Literally mm -hmm. fog. Like it's like- No, a, it's not. Not no, fog, not but fogger. A fogger. Yes. 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 Trying to do that and then follow up with, you know, other towel treatments and all this stuff, so- it's all a learning process because the strips were, you know, hard because you have to time it when it's not too hot. Mm -hmm. But then we have these summers, you know. Mm -hmm. So, people as with any integrated pest management program, there's multiple multiple tools at our disposal to use different times of year. But they are, I mean, just you know, I'm just thinking like with at work. I use a lot of beneficials. I use a lot of non-toxic, but for mites, there's doesn't seem to be anything that's not, I mean, I use beneficial insects for that, but you guys have to use things that are, I guess what I'm trying to say is there's nothing that's greatly organic right now to treat the mites, correct? I think most of the treatments are organic, like formic acid, thymol. Oh, okay. Um, thymol, the organic essential oil from the thyme plant. Oh yeah, um, okay. Oxalic acid. Noxolic acid is found in a lot of tree cavities because of the way the the uh, organic material starts to decompose. Uh -huh. You'll actually find higher concentrations of oxalic acid in decaying tree cavities. And then that's what they're using. Like Tina mentioned with the fogger, the oxalic acid foggers. Oh. Um, that does great on contact kill on the mites. But you need to cycle that out because it won't penetrate any of the cells to kill the developing mites. Mm -hmm. So you have to apply it every week to catch every emerging round of brood. Got it. But that's and there's other things you want to not use if you have honey supers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I knew timing was, but but that's nice to know that there's things that are uh relatively because when I got some of the the I think it was the strips, the warnings on them, I'm like. Oh God, it's either going to, my, my bees are going to die from mites or I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not one that's like, Oh no, no chemicals, nothing. But it, it was a little, it was in the timing too. I'm like, I'm going to mess this up somehow and it's going to get in the honey. Um, there's a, there's a par not a parasite, a predator called the pseudo scorpion. And it's <laughs> basically a, a microscopic scorpion without a tail. And those will eat varroa mites, but they'll never be, in there in the amount of numbers that would be actually beneficial to a hive. Um, they're it. more like, a, they're more like janitors cleaning up the dead bodies at the bottom mm -hmm. instead of going and stopping the. Got it. 
Yeah, well, I like the fact that the oxalic acid is, uh, you know, in the tree cavity. I mean, I I imagine that that's why I have two healthy hives on the property is because one, I I leave them alone and I my hands don't touch them, so they're like, thank you, lady, just back off. We know what we're doing, and <laughs> and that'll be a good that a good chemical application to the hive. And there's also like mechanical and cultural practices we use. We'll take the queen and we'll cage the queen to a, a three by five inch space on one frame essentially smash a metal shield around her to keep her on one side with the screen uh -huh. and the bees will feed her but what it does is it breaks the brood cycle and the brood is where the varroa mites develop so if you break that laying cycle you're breaking the varroa cycle as well so there's different methods we can employ um, without even using chemicals to combat the varroa mite hey tina what do you do with all the swarms you get Oh, put them in different uh, hive boxes and on different properties. Okay, so you do put them on different properties. And then you mm -hmm. collect, and they're yours, so I know you have your own honey. Mm -hmm. And you just showed a picture. So like <laughs> Did you just harvest honey? Is that why you're bottling right now? Uh-huh. Okay, so how many pounds There's, did you get? And uh, This, just this, is from three hives. Uh -huh. I remember I told you one of them was that birth, the lady who had a birthday. Uh huh. We got so much from that one. Remember, I just caught that one in March. What? So, uh huh. So all these other ones, there's three total, and we got 85 pounds. Holy! Wow. That's the most we've ever gotten from three hives. There's, uh, it was crazy. It was really, really crazy. So three hives, one and of one the of them you was first. Just got in March. One of the boxes, yes. So that was the birthday, we call it the birthday hive. <laughs> we have all these nicknames. And yes, I do have one box that's called Mean Girls. <laughs> very, very mean. It will follow us across the street and, and three houses down and keep ping, pinging the suits because they're Mean Girls. Oh, uh, wow. That's and, hilarious. And in fact, um, I was helping Blake with, uh, we were helping Blake with uh, this one that we got off a house, but two weeks before, remember that one, Blake? Yep. Um, they lived on the side, the siding, underneath the siding of a house, mm -hmm. but they kept swarming. So the lady calls up a couple weeks before I helped Blake and they were in the tree. So I got that one. Those, of course, are called house bees. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. So creative. <laughs> so creative. But then the um, the ones um, along the siding, Blake tried so hard to get her, but she was fast and she was hiding the queen. So I think they're still living there. Have you talked to her, Blake? Yeah, they're still there. And that is because the neighbor has beehive that she's not managing correctly and they're swarming. And I would say oh. about 20 to 25% of our calls for swarms this year have been from known beekeepers hives that were not managed oh. we even we were we were um you know as a courtesy ask we said are these your bees because mm. if they're your bees and they just swarm you know 10 feet from your property go, by all means go get them you know what i mean i don't want to take something that if they go yeah those are my bees mm -hmm. she should know those are her bees but she didn't probably didn't realize they go no i see bees in my boxes that they're okay oh but wow. see they probably Half of them probably swarm, yeah. right? The old, like she was, like Blake was saying, the old queen left with some of them. So maybe that's what's my house bees. <laughs> yeah, and she wasn't even aware goes, no. that they could possibly swarm. I Say think. Again? I mean, she said she saw bees in her box, so she didn't even know that they could swarm and split. Guess not. See, this is where I'm like, I've killed two. And I know that. So sometimes it's more just luck sometimes. You didn't kill two because you said you didn't see any bees on one of the things. Yeah. They swarmed. So you didn't kill them. I didn't they kill left. them. They left. They, they and were I, irritated with the landlord. And Yes. And I think the other ones left. Yeah. I wasn't treating the uh, the ant issue in their condo. Yeah. So they left. And I think the other ones left too, probably because I think I put it too close to the tree with the other hive. Um. <laughs> And then, you know, Joe had vacuumed them and they were just <laughs> they're like, this is not the place for us. Um, OK, so you. Wow, that's a lot of honey. That, that is a lot so of honey. But honey. listen, listen, Blake has 
a lot more bees than I do. I don't have that many beehives, uh-huh. but um, that's why if I sell, it's very rare. If, you know, people get some uh-huh. because it's limited, right? Yeah. It's very limited. It's a boutique. But you call it boutique, honey. I'm boutique. Yes. Blake though has yeah. a lot. Blake, tell her I'm, how many I'm, I'm, you harvested last I'm year. I'm getting to them, Tina. I'm getting to them. <laughs> <laughs> there's always a waiting list, no matter how much you get. There's always people. Wow. Okay, so how many hives do you have? How many pounds of honey? Pounds, gallons? Well, yeah, most of our, half of our hives are new. So okay. every year we, we increase our stock with, with new swarms. Mm-hmm. And I try and focus on honey production. On the, so the way I set the program up, we come out of winter with hives and we harvest all the honey out of the hives in late winter to clean them out and get them ready for the spring flow. And then once the bees fill those boxes up. Now we're getting swarms. I'll put swarms into single boxes. Now we'll take the honey off the big hives and harvest it, give that empty comb to the swarms, and then give empty boxes to the big hives and have the big hives draw more comb. So it's kind of an assembly line of rotating boxes. That way new swarms always have drawn comb to get into. Got it. And then drawn, if we give them drawn comb, that's the equity and you can get, you can start pulling honey throughout the season. And I try and pull, instead of pulling boxes, I try and pull a few frames from each, each hive and then do it that way. Okay. So I do multiple pulls. Cause if you look at it like a, like a bowling alley, if you look at, they number the pins one through 10. And if you're looking down at the hive from the top, you can kind of number them one through 10 left to right. And usually number one and 10 have the honey because the bees will put honey on the outsides, almost like a jacket to keep them warm. Got it. And the brood column goes up the middle. And at the top, you'll have your, your honey stores. So depending on the time of year, we'll go through. So we've got about 50 hives that we rely on for honey production. And then the other 50 are going to be for comb building with the swarms. Wow. And you, 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 are you harvesting? You said you do the harvest, um, not this time of year, because is that correct? Did I hear that right? If I have time, I'll do it as often as I can okay. every, every two weeks. Okay. So you're constantly pulling. Yes. Honey then. Okay. Where, where do you sell your honey? You said there's always a, do you sell it just, um, online? Just do you sell it? Word of store? mouth. And we've got a farm that we sell produce and veggies. So we're always in old fair Oaks on the weekends selling face to face. What's the name? What's it under? Uh, Sacramento beekeeper. Oh, and it's not a, it's not a uh, farmer's market. We just set up at the old Fair Oaks park. Oh, okay. Okay. We've got tomatoes, squash, peppers, and oh, then nice. the uh, honey folds right in. And okay. we actually did some cut comb this year too. It's Ooh. been a few years since we did cut comb. People like honey comb. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I try and get between 50 and 75 pounds per hive at, at the, at the end of the year from each one. Wow. Wow. Cause you can kind of time it. You know, the privet's a big flow, blackberries a big flow, all the maples are big flows. Maples and citrus kind of coincide with the clover and the vetch. And then elm comes in in the fall and then star thistle carries you through the summertime. With so the privets. I, I was going to ask about that. When you see that labeled as a specific um, forage plant, like, you know, you'll see, oh, this is thistle honey lavender honey or something um you're you could sort of say that confidently because you're pulling honey from certain seasons but if you just pull your honey one time you're not guaranteed that it's just going to be that flower right correct it depends on the concentration of forage around the hive Mm because the bee when they leave the hive whatever they encounter first say it's a a mint to the hit they'll only travel around and collect mint for that entire trip they yep. won't get a sunflower and then a apple and then a pear and then a but so that's why you see the pollen is a homogeneous color it's a single color on them so if the bees are going out and whatever they hit they're collecting only that it depends on your concentration of forage out there so if you're putting the bees out in sunflower fields odds are very high that they're going to be hitting a sunflower on their first trip therefore increasing the odds that's going to be a sunflower product mm-hmm. or a single source honey. Okay. Um, a lot of farmers grow cover crops and there's also just other naturally occurring crops out there. And the bees will hit that like the plantain. That's a big popular one out in the, in the foothills. Um, mm. And 
So to be able to call it a single source honey, you got to know when that bloom's coming, put your bees there, empty out any honey you had before. So you know, it's only that. Mm -hmm. And then even then you can assume that they've collected other things during that time. Yeah. So that's why you see big price increases on single source honey because of that time and effort and locations they need to obtain to get that to come together. Got it. Yeah, that's okay. a lot of work. That's a lot of work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and what's the point? Do you really notice the difference in the taste? Oh yeah, absolutely. Really? Okay. All right. Over a over hundred types of honey in my, my collection. And anytime I see a new flavor, I'll buy it. And anytime I meet a beekeeper, like I've traded jars with Tina, um, <laughs> seven or eight other members in the beekeeping association. And it's fun to trade, huh? Oh, indeed. And then getting different types of uh, flavors from cutouts uh -huh. and then noticing the consistency, the flavor, the color, the location, and the time of year we did it. And it's, it's almost like a wine. You can, you can go back and say, oh, 2008, well, what a great year. The soil was good that year. You know, this type of grape did the best. And it's almost a time capsule of what the bees collected that year at that time frame, because it'll never, ever be the same again. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I'm pretty good at olive oil tasting just because I've worked a lot of olive oil orchards. Uh, actually, I had a friend with a new olive oil, gave me some and, you know, I critiqued, I critiqued it because, you know, we're trying to work on improving it. Um, but yeah, I guess it's like, it's like honey. I mean, you need to do, you need to do honey tasting. Like she, Next she time I see you, I will. Yeah. I'm saying like, do you like fancy, you know, uh, farm to fork honey tasting events? That'll just people yeah, will like. gobble that up. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> we're trying to we're trying to formulate a honey tasting event here for the holidays. Uh -huh. to, okay. To do with this. We want yeah. to include the Sacramento Beekeeping Association on that one. Yeah, get people like you know, here's some lavender honey. Here's some, uh, you know, thistle honey. Uh, and see, you know, basil. Mine would be basil because I let all my basil go to flower, and the bees absolutely love basil. So it'd be basil flowers, whether or not you know. But, uh, and then Tina, where do you, you sell yours? Where? Cordy Brothers and Chili Smith. Chili, Chili Smith, a uh, little mom and pop uh, shop. They sell heirloom beans. He might be another good person for you to talk yeah, to. Yeah, beans. So okay. interesting because I've never seen these types of beans before ever. And uh, anyway, they're limited hours in Carmichael and of course, Cordy Brothers on Folsom Boulevard in Sacramento. But again, remember Boutique. Boutique. Only a certain amount. Yep. No, that that's the way you say it. it's boutique. It's boutique. boutique. And you know, one thing I was going to say, you know, those, I told you um, the honey that we just extracted mm -hmm. came from three different hives. Mm -hmm. Of course, we left lots for the bees. Don't take it all, you yeah. know, because they need their honey. Yeah. But um, all three taste different. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And interesting. and two of the boxes were right next door, next to each other. So crazy. they're it's just really crazy how they taste different. So next time I see you, I'll bring them. And so you can taste it. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, guys, I could talk forever with bees because one, I'm learning so much Two, I'm still just mystified by it. And then three, you guys know everything yeah. about bees. Um, but I don't want to keep you forever because, um, I'll have to have you guys on again and we'll have to like, have it like maybe like go deeper into when you have a hive, what the other steps are um, and how to maybe split your own hive and things like that. So I'll have to have you two on again. Um, but, it. but Blake, what's your, what's all your social media stuff so people could follow you? Um, SacramentoBeekeeper.com and then Sacramento Beekeeper on social medias. Okay. Like Instagram, I follow you on Instagram and what's the site on Facebook that, um, it's the Sacramento beekeepers, right? Is that the site? Sacramento beekeeper. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of that stuff is over my head when I read, but I still read it because I'm hoping it'll sink in. Um, but you know, sometimes it's like reading a different language when bee people are talking. I'm just like, what? <laughs> uh, Tina, what's your Instagram? Tina Makua, every other letter's a vowel. <laughs> <laughs> I just posted um, something about me pouring, uh, you know, honey in a bucket for the, you know, just filtrating it with, uh, you know, cheesecloth, making sure it's all nice and smooth. So 
I, I know. I see the whole processing of honey is a whole entire thing on its own. And then we could even talk about those flow hives that are new on the market and whether <laughs> see, I knew it. Yeah. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. That yeah, I think people think, oh, it's like a keg. You could just stick this thing in there and then just start pulling honey. But um yeah, I knew that beekeepers didn't like that. But no, we could talk about honey processing. Um, what's interesting is we have, uh, and do you guys like, do you get your supplies at the Sacramento Beekeeper Place in Sac? There's a bee box in Sacramento too? Um, there are, but they've been um, abysmally backordered by their suppliers. Oh, for okay. And there's Man Lake, which is up in Woodland. Actually, I, I, I go to Man Lake a lot. Yeah, I mean, I'm one Woodland. city south, and it's amazing that we have it. It's a big, giant warehouse of everything. And it's sort of fun just to just to wander through and see what they have. Um, yeah. Because they, they have a big catalog, though, that you could get things. But when you're there and you could see the giant, uh, like, honey um, processing equipment, too. I mean, this is serious business for people. I mean, this is people's business. So it's, it's a very expensive hobby. It, uh, yes. It, yes. It could be. A, I've never had one of those expensive hobbies <laughs> ever. <laughs> right. that's, what we do. that's what we do full time. Yeah. Yeah. Is this is your is this this is your career, though, right, Blake? Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. This is my company. This is what we do. Yeah. Yeah. I think that one of the things that may, you may want to further speak about with Blake is like cutouts versus trap outs, you know, because it's so interesting, you know, when someone says, I keep hearing a buzz in my bedroom wall, <laughs> <laughs> you know, things like that. And it's a whole hive of bees oh inside God. the you know wall. Uh. You know, Blake deals with all that. I'm just the one who likes to go get them on the trees and the bushes. So that's, you know. Yeah. He's the one who has to cut things. Do you, you're the one cutting into it, right, Blake? Yeah. And you have to get permission, and you must know Indeed. something about construction and electrical. Yeah, we don't want to. We don't want to saw into a wall and electrocute ourselves. Exactly. Cut a load bearing wall. Um, and, we have all of our. We, we send estimates to the clients. Clients review it, and then they approve it, and then we move forward with the work at that point. And then we've also have um, licensed contractors on on the crew on staff to do necessary repairs with its like stucco or drywall. And stuff like that. Yeah, because taking out a wall is serious business. Yep, and it's uh, it, it is an expense. Um, it's sometimes it it can incur quite a quite a cost, and sometimes it turns into an insurance claim for the homeowner, depending on how bad it is. Yeah, yeah, but you're the you're the guy to call if something is in your wall. Indeed, <laughs> I like that. I'm the guy to call if something's in your wall. I'm going to use that. Yeah. Yeah. Be, be yeah. speaking, not if you have like a snake or something that's, and then Tina's, Tina's uh, the one to call. If, well, I mean, you too, Blake, but you know, the swarms that are at eye level for Tina. <laughs> there you go. There you in go. August, yeah. I'll be speaking at the uh, Placer County Realtors Association in August to do some awareness training on what to look for in structures when people are buying and selling houses on how to prevent vectors for bees to get in. Okay. And you'll have that on your, your, uh, Instagram, you'll Indeed. advertise that. Okay. And then, yeah. So people could find you. Um, and I'll, I'll put the, I'll put the links on the, the show notes and I want to come out and I know Blake, you've, you were mentioning every time you said, Hey, there's a swarm we're going out to here. And I'm like, ah, I can't make it. I can't make it. And, and that's the thing is you don't plan any of, I mean, maybe some of the, the cutouts you have to plan because there's some logistics to it, but far, as far as swarm, you just have to, if it fits into your schedule, you're out there, you know, it's not yeah, like, you're yeah, you're on call. So, um, it would be fun Tina to go to one of your swarms. I know they're wrapping up now, but it'd also be fun to go to one of your cutouts, uh, too. So we teach classes and the, the point of us teaching classes is to get people prepared to be able to recover a swarm successfully uh -huh. and also to make sure they're they're educated and they can pass a, a short certification test. And once they're certified, then we can refer calls to them. Oh, uh, okay. Use, I don't want to refer a call to an inex inexperienced beekeeper. And, you know, someone might get hurt or the yeah. bees might be, you know, injured or yeah. things mm -hmm. like that. And so people are interested, we will definitely set people up with the, the right knowledge and get them the right tools and equipment to be successful in doing this. Yeah. I don't think our shop vac was the right equipment to vacuum up. <laughs> <our place. laughs> mm -hmm. Marlene, one other thing too, if when people are 
considering becoming beekeepers, uh -huh. learn all you can from, you know, there's so many people who don't mind teaching and don't mind introducing. And there's um, mentors too. I, I read people who are like, yes. I need a mentor. And that means someone c would be willing to come out um, and help you inspect to show you what you're looking for. And I wanted one, but I'm just so far out that, you know, it, it, it does, you know, I don't want someone to drive way out. Um, but oh, for, you mean your distance? Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, I definitely have no idea what I'm, even though I took a class and I'm following, I think it's one of those, it's experience, it's experience and just learning from the, you know, it's like gardening experience, learning from your mistakes, not getting right. discouraged, uh, talking to people, reading, looking at things. Oh. Here's my tip. Okay. So I was catching a swarm. It was in a, a tree and I was getting impatient. So then I was like, come on, go in the box. And a lot of them were going in the box from the tree because some of them, you know, fell uh -huh. and they were on the bark. So they're going, I let put the box on the ground. And I, um, so they were going in, but as I was getting impatient and it was getting darker, I'm like, okay, I'm going to push a few more in the box uh -huh. to help them out. Then they got really, really pissy. Oh. And I did not zip my hood that I wear a full suit yeah. all the way and Velcro it. Mm -hmm. Two got into my face mm -hmm. area and I pinched one because then the other one got me like right in my neck area. And, you know, I've gotten stung before and a few times. And so, but this one, I was like within like half an hour, an hour driving them home. I noticed that I was really itchy and feeling weird. <laughs> By the time I got home, like 20 minutes later, I was completely red. And so went to emergency and they uh, gave me, you know, whatever they gave me. I a drill cocktail or whatever it was. And I was out. And she's, well, she's going to be going to sleep for a couple hours. And then you go, can go home, which was like, uh, you know, 1 a.m. And remember, I have to get up at 3 a.m. to go to work. Oh. So um, I stayed home that day. But like always you know, use protection. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I remember you being stung and then I, then you did have a bad reaction and, um, you know, I don't want to say, uh, you know, allergic to bees. Like I, I am, well, I did a blood test with my, aller my uh -huh. um, allergist and I'm fully <laughs> allergic. allergic to bees because my blood level was very high. Yes. Allergic to bees. So now I'm um, B immunotherapy shots yes, I get that's every month. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, I make sure it's Velcroed my neck, you know, and everything's zipped up, especially even on a hundred degree day, like today, 102, whatever it is. And it's so hot and so uncomfortable, but I'd rather not get stung and take a chance. You know, I did get stung on the lip uh, a couple months ago. I remember and, that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Remember? And then coworkers are thinking it really looked beautiful and then I should get lip injections. Yep. I thought you did. And just making excuses and saying you're stung by a bee. I'm like, uh-huh, <laughs> Tina. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, oh, well, look at it. it. didn't really react too much other than the area of the, on my lip. And so the bee shots are working, you know, and not everybody can get bee shots. You actually have to have a blood test and, and, you know, these are the things to consider. Some people go, oh, I'm allergic to bees. I'm like, how do you know you're allergic yeah. to bees? Oh, when yeah. I got stung by it when I was a kid, you know, yeah. I got, you know, it's like, no, you got to get a blood test. You got to, you know, so anyway, yeah. just be careful. No, I'm glad you said that because a lot of people will say, oh, I can't keep bees or I can't be around bees because I'm allergic to bees. You are 100% allergic to bees and that's not stopping you. So I don't know what that says about you, Tina. Uh, I, it, you, I mean, you're stubborn or you're like, eh, not the No, because <laughs> as, as Blake and I were saying, going to work with the bees, look at the bees, catch the bees. It's such a little, it's such a high. Yeah, I was going to so say it's, it's an fun. adrenaline high for you guys. It's very therapeutic as well. If you're, yes, you're having yes. a, you got to concentrate on what you're doing and focus, but mm -hmm. push things out of your mind and really pay attention to what you're doing. I, and in the moment. Yeah, I get that. I get the, the being in the moment type hobbies where you're, yeah. I mean, those, those are I the love, best. I love learning new things. I learn something new all the time from different beekeepers mm -hmm. and just learning and learning because they're fascinating little creatures. They are. They're amazing. I didn't know about the tummy, hun honey tummy. And yeah. uh, now I'm going to go look at, look and see if I could find some, well, they wouldn't be now, but yeah, no, I mean, I love them. And, um, that's why I don't want to get a swarm and kill it. 
<laughs> one thing to remember, they're, honeybees are not from America. Yeah. So if anyone is interested about keeping bees, mm-hmm. I'd encourage them to plant some California native plants to support the native pollinators. Yes. Because honeybees are displacing them uh, yeah. in an astonishing rate. You know, I just saw a post that was, I'm not going to say bashing people who keep bees, but it was leaning towards that way. And everything is a balance. Yes, there's native pollinators. Yes, we need to support them. But we also need food. And we know that honeybees are great at pollinating large crops of food. So it's all a balance. And you need people to be honest with themselves. We, the bees don't need to be saved. We need to save the bees for the artificial demand we've created mm-hmm. for our food supply. Yeah, of them. Mm, that's what I was saying. The large food. crops that we that wouldn't, you know, that humans are doing, which we need. So yeah, yeah. indeed. And just remember, no pesticides, everyone. And, that, and the the monocrop is a big problem. You can get cover crops and interplant mm-hmm. everything. It's so much more healthy for your ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. So it's all, it, it's a, it's a balance to, you know, a certain extent, but they are amazing little creatures and, um, thanks guys. I don't want to keep you any longer, but see Tina, you could go on and on. You were like, uh, uh, what am I <laughs> we're going to go to Carmichael this morning and we're going to do a cutout of a hive, oh. a house that was built in the thirties. Oh, cool. Take some pictures and post them. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well so, and then, sure. then when you guys have one planned, let me know. And hopefully I could go to the next one. All well, right. Only if you promise that you'll have bees again come next spring. I, I'm trying to get them. I have the hive with the lemongrass. I just didn't catch one, but I will. You have to sort of set up and order your bees now to get them in spring. I know that. So I better do that. Um, or uh, maybe I know some people who have some bees. Maybe. Or can help you I recommend more. getting a swarm locally because you can get it sooner and they're going to be genetics that are locally acclimatized. Okay as opposed to getting shipped in from like Orland or things yeah. like that. Okay. How about that? Put me on a name of a swarm and I'll come out and help you. And they'll be my swarm. Deal. Okay. You okay. Got it. Okay. This one's for the plant lady. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We're going to help her. We're going to get good genetics and it's not going to be a mean girls one. I don't want the mean girls. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You just have plant lady bees. Yeah. There you go. Oh well, no. Those would be bitch. <laughs> 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 An extra hungry. <laughs> So anyway, we have a good day, ladies. Yeah. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Happy gardening. Take care.